Welcome to the My Personal Football Coach Youth Soccer Player Development Podcast, episode 56 with Martin Ho. Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. Hi guys, welcome back to another show. This week we've got a fantastic guest. It's Martin Ho, who's currently the assistant uh, coach at Manchester United's women's team, the first team there. Uh, Martin's had a really uh, illustrious um, uh, career, working uh, starting off at the academy at Everton and working in the women's program there, going across and working at Liverpool in their women's program, heading up the academy and then moving over to Man United to to um, support Casey Stone there with the first team. Uh, really engaging hour of interesting chat with Martin. He's really eloquent, uh, fant- passionate, um, really really interesting guy. Uh, comes over with some great ideas. Um, you can tell why he's had such a good, successful career in terms of the way he communicates and talks about the game and his ideas and obviously the way he's progressed through through the game. So I'm really privileged that Martin uh, joined us. And I'll tell you what, like if you have aspirations of working uh, at, a, at a high level in football, this one's not to be missed. You know, take take the lessons from Martin in terms of the way he approached it and the way he's moved up, up the ladder and always learning from top players excuse me, top coaches at clubs like Everton and then progressing up through to Liverpool and then, you know, working at May United now. So really interesting. I'll tell you what, really one of the most engaging podcasts I've done in a long time. Uh, really, really enjoyed it. So really, you know, you're going to enjoy this one. But now I've got a really important big announcement to make. Really proud to, to announce the launch of the My Personal Football Coach Virtual Academy. This is the first virtual academy in the world. This gives players the opportunity to experience Premier League Academy coaching. So basically I've assembled like a dream team of youth developers um, to provide a complete holistic development program completely delivered online. Uh, So basically players are going to experience technical, tactical, physical, psychological, uh, all through the app. Um, like I said, I'm really privileged to have people like Mark Reese on board, on board who's uh, the former Man City Academy coach, one of the best uh, coach player developers I've ever come across in terms of when I'm speaking to him. He often blows my mind of his knowledge and his background. Obviously, he developed some top, top players. Uh, then we have Scott Chickleday, who's a forward specialist coach, works a lot with pros individually, previously worked at Tottenham and QPR, uh, forward coach specialist. Uh, then we've got Glenn Hicks, uh, former Tottenham Hotspur Academy coach, a uh, real deep thinker, really thoughtful guy. Again, someone who really challenges me about the game when I speak to him. And then really privileged now, we've got Stephen Salas aboard. Steve Salas is a, a, a mindset stroke psychology specialist. He's going to be providing weekly psychology uh, classroom sessions uh, for players. Uh, these are going to be staggered for different times on Saturdays to, to give people from all around the world in different time zones the opportunity to access and take part. And they'll obviously be pre-recorded as well so we can, you can watch them back. And then we've got Simon Brundish, who's one of the best S&C coaches around, uh, Man City consultant, uh, worked at lots of pro clubs and has a, a fantastic uh, S&C business in developing young players. He's going to be delivering the physical element of the course. So this is a three-month course. Players will get like a weekly exclusive full ball mastery session from myself, a full individual session. They'll get like a tutorial from the four corner model delivered by one of these top, top specialists. And then Steve is going to be delivering a weekly mindset uh, psychology stroke classroom session uh, for the students and they're going to be regular question and answer sessions for me so really proud of this you know in the current climate I think is a necessity but you know giving players the opportunity wherever they are in the world to get world-class coaching there's nothing like this out in the world in terms of like I'm seriously like you know I'm blessed that these guys are coming aboard these are guys who really challenge me and, and develop my thinking uh, when I do that so if you're interested in that we're going to put the 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 link and the in the in the description here for the podcast or just go to my personal football coach uh, forward slash virtual academy and you can check it out it's going to kick off on the 30th of november and be a three-month course to start off with and uh, we'll see how it goes but yeah like i said i'm really excited about this and uh, i'm really thinking about it. it's an opportunity to give players wherever you are in the world uh a pitching for players 12 upwards to begin with uh, giving them a taste of Premier League Academy football elite development from some of the best youth developers in the world. So, like I said, if you're interested about youth development, go check that out. But without further ado, let's get into the show. Okay, Martin Ho, welcome to the show. Cheers, all. Thanks for having me. 
Cheers, mate. So uh, can you give us a little bit of a brief uh, outline of your playing and coaching journey up to this point, please, mate? Um, yeah, so obviously when I was younger, I played, um, I was at Everton for a little while. Um, obviously then was released. Obviously went into coaching quite early. Um, around 17, 18, started doing my badges while I was playing. Um, coached at Everton within the boys' academy, coached Everton within the women's setup. up um, Moved on to Liverpool to look after their girls' academy in their under-21s. Um, further moved on from that into um, to Manchester United, um, where I was working with the under-21s girls' academy programme. Um, and now, obviously, this season, um, from July it was, um, I've moved into a new role as the assistant head coach of the women's first team. Well, you've done that in under 50 seconds. That might be the best one so far I've ever had, mate. <laughs> <laughs> that was short and sharp. So let's talk about then your like your, your initial coaching. Your first, talk about your first job at Everton. Um, how that how that happened and tell us about what exactly you were doing there. So it, was, it all come about from... Um, Meeting, networking online and speaking to people via as it's LinkedIn, Twitter, and you obviously get to know people through it. Um, and I come across one of the um, recruitment team, Everton, um, and he put me in touch with, um, give me the opportunity to do some some work at Everton. And I did that. Um, I still had contacts from when I'd, I played as a youth player, um, so that was important. Um, of then, well, you, you 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 played at Everton, did you? Yeah, when I was really young. Yeah, um, right. obviously then was released and. It was good just to be able to go to a club and be given an opportunity so um to work within there when I first started out and it was was to go and work with their pre academy um right. which was very very good and I enjoyed probably learned some more in that short spell of working with the pre academy than I did probably building up doing my badges if I'm being honest with some of the experience that I was working with and um, with those coaches so obviously was doing the pre academy for a while and then dropped in and out of the youth development stages um youth development phase and um, with some of the 12s and 13s and um, which was good and um, but then quickly moved into like a a secondary role alongside that with the with the women and um, so the women were part-time at that point and um Andy Spence asked me to come in and assist him with that so I did when they were in the Women's Super League 2 and um, now it's obviously the championship that then progressed quite quickly we got from we won the WSL 2 Spring Series which was a mini tournament in the summer to bridge a gap and um, to get them back into a a September start and um, run alongside in terms of what the men's do in terms of the Premier League. And um, we went full time. And um, so I went full time with the women's team then, which is unbelievable being in a full time environment. Um, with well, obviously let's, let's, just, let's just hold it there because I want to get ahead because that's really interesting. Let's, let's just wind back a bit. Tell yeah. us about the first, your first experience with the eights pre academy. Was, was Paul there, my mate? Paul there was Paul there. Paul so, Bennett, yeah. So yeah, Paul Bennett, my mate. Paul. Yeah, so I mean, tell us about they're, they're like legends in there, in there, you know, around so the the Everton boys how they do things. Tell us a bit yeah, about yeah. the how what's the what's the how, what's the philosophy with the eights and how do they play and what was the coaching so like? That's there? someone I learned a great deal from Saul in terms of helping me in terms of working with younger players and giving them the first steps into obviously academy football, but in football in general, um, in terms of the, the philosophy and the style they want to play is they want players to be brave, they want players to stay on the ball. They want them to be very good 1v1, which I know is something you're massive on um, in terms of having those excellent um, excellence in 1v1 skills, making them be brave. Can they pass the ball? Can they run with it? But they were encouraged a lot to stay on the ball, which I liked because it's going to obviously set them up fair down the line. And um, Paul was massive on that, looking at real refined technical details. So making sure when they come in, they had the ball on the wall constantly. Um, yeah. They were in lots of 1v1 duels. They were doing a lot of technical work. Um, but you put them in a lot of situations where they were dueled. It was 2v2, 3v3. Um, but always encouraging them to to run and stay on the ball and be clever um, and be creative with what they'd done. Um, and there was one thing that always... We had we had punch words every time a player had the ball. So he, he'd shout... If you wanted the player to beat someone 1v1, he'd shout dodge. And the players would pick those words up and they'd become muscle memory in the end because the players would start doing it naturally. Um, right. And they were really important for me at that those age groups when I was I was working with those sevens and eights, six, sevens and eights, was to really drill down on the, the small details in terms of encouraging them to be skillful one v one and be dominant. Um and that was from a, an offensive point of view and defensive. Um but Paul let me a lot in terms of what's required at that level just to coach those younger players and how important yeah. it is to give them that kind of confidence and um ability to be able to go and do that at a young age group and then help them develop as they move through. And, and tell us about the environment, the under-8s environment up in the north. 
West there, you got competition, Liverpool, United, City. What was that like and how did that impact what you were doing there? You've got, as you just said then, you've got rivalries, you've got Manchester United, you've got Man City, you've got you've got Liverpool, obviously, which is a big one. Um, and don't get me wrong, there's, there's players at those younger age groups all who will be training with you and be training with Liverpool. Um, and you can't always control that unless they get to eights where they then become part of the club when they're in six and sevens in pre-academy. They'd probably be leaving your session at Evans to go to Liverpool for another one later on. And that that becomes difficult. But the way the setup was run, the environment, the culture, um, the opportunities that the boys were given at those young age groups to train two or three times a week, if they were doing well, they'd step up and go and train with an older age group. Um, the coaching that we were getting, they, there was three, four coaches working with those pre-academies. So really the ratio to coach was probably three or four players to a coach, um, which was really good because they're getting more one-on-one -on -one and more individual individual coaching, which was key. Um, but yeah, with the rivalry being up there, you're always going to compete. But I always believed with being at Everton and working with that sort of staff, I believe that we always had, when we played at eights, for example, we played against Liverpool, we always had the upper hand um, because we always had the better players due to the infrastructure and the coaching setup we had. Um, but I always thought it was down to the programme that Paul put in place, Paul Bennett put in place in terms of him and Lee. Those two had a real strong um, programme in place, but the players really bought into where they was because of the enthusiasm and um, the details that they give them, the confidence they probably give them to allow them to make mistakes and make a mistake. Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I always remember like at being, especially like Chelsea, uh, playing at Everton, the eights and nines, always being really impressed in how they, you know, their game understanding, how they move the ball, they're working as a team. You know, they're really good, you know, quality, you know, team football as well as being good on the ball. They're really good team football as well. Yeah, yeah. And that's something Paul was massive on. He'd, it, it wouldn't just be about them staying on the ball and being brave. He wanted them to have played to a club model and a club philosophy. And if that was them stay on the ball and playing out from the back, which was a key one, making them be brave and um, stay on the ball and play out, making sure that went defensively, which is something I've always known as, as an Everton member of staff and an Everton, um, looking at Everton players, is they're very defensively, they're very organised. They're aggressive. They're very good in terms of duels, and they're hard to beat. Um, and these are the things that we were. I, I was always brought up around in terms of with Paul is we've got to be really good on the ball when we're going to be brave when we play, but then defensively we've got to be really hard to beat. Um, so, then how, was, so how, how? And then how do you? My question is, you know, you've got a, a local lad. How do you convince them to come to Everton? You know, instead of Liverpool, particularly in the current climate. In the current climate, I think the way I do it is if you. I would encourage the player to come in and see the setup and come in and work with the coaches first hand to be able to see what they can do. Because I don't believe, in my opinion, with the staff that are there in terms of within their youth setup when I was there, I don't believe any other player would have went to Liverpool if they're the coming and seeing Paul Lee and the other staff work. Um, with the way they work plays, how welcome they were with the players. But the little punch words and the little how they created the environment that the players wanted to be there. I'd seen some players that have gone through those pre-academy ages, six, sevens and eights, and now have, have gone on and they've virtually signed on professional contracts um, at the club, which is impressive. And if I look at the youth age groups, I always think that if you come into an environment at Everton when I was there and they have to choose between a Liverpool or Everton, I think they'd choose an Everton environment more because it was very honest. Um, you knew what you were getting and you're working with top, top coaches who had a track record of developing these young players, which was really important, that they, they had a pathway and somewhere with a vision where they could look forward to see where the career could go. Interesting. Okay, let's talk about when you're moving into the YDP. Um, tell us a little bit about that. And tell us a little bit about that yourself as a coach, as a practitioner. What was that like in terms of delivering sessions, your, your, your self-belief? You know, what was that like being in that environment? Unbelievable. Moving into that, I work with someone called Jamie Russell. Um, I, think I know Jamie, a good friend of mine. Yeah, Jamie's at West Brom. Now I dropped in and done a couple of sessions with him in the YDP. Um, a couple with Scott Phelan, who's still there now. Um, so worked in terms of alongside them and done some work with them. And that was, for me, working at those age groups was, was really interesting because you're trying to get that balance all between coming out of a, a 5v5 into a 7v7, 9v9, um, and then you're trying to help them bridge that gap to go into that 11-a-side football. And, but that was probably the best age groups I like working with because a lot of those players we work with around Jamie's age group, it was around 13s. Um, a lot of those yeah. players have now gone on to sign professional contracts, which has been really good to see because it's shown all the work we, that the staff have put in over those years to help them develop. And Jamie was someone for me, the environment he created, how professional he was with his approach, um, 
how thorough he was with his plan and detail, I think has enabled that group to be one of the most successful within Everton's academy when I was there um, in terms of performance, in terms of challenging one another. Um, but for me as a coach and me working with those type of players, that only helped me because I always felt I had to deliver something that was challenging. I had to make sure that not just the group were challenged, but the individual was. Um, and making sure that if, uh, if I had to step up and do anything, that I was confident what I was doing because... You know yourself if if you do something that players don't feel challenged, you'll see it straight away. Um, it, and that was, it's, that was it's interesting thing. because it's interesting because you talk about working with Paul. Obviously, I know Paul really well, and Jamie Jamie Russell is, is top top coach. And that, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I think that's the benefit of working at a club like that. You're you know you're surrounded by fantastic role models, really. Aren't yeah. you? You're learning from some of the best, you know, and then that has an impact on your career and and where you go and what you're delivering. Is that right? A hundred percent, Paul was the, the first one in terms of working with pre-academy younger age groups was someone who really instilled the confidence and belief in me that I could coach and I could deliver and it really trying to shape kind of my philosophy and, and my coaching philosophy of how I wanted to work. Um, and then working with Jamie, someone who was had, had vast experience at other clubs. He's obviously come into Everton and he's done extremely well there. Now he's he's moved on to is, is obviously his future now. But Jamie was someone who I picked so much up in terms of around the technical and tactical side of the game, um, how thorough he was with his planning, but how precise it was in terms of how he made it realistic to the game, even at a smaller format, um, for such a young coach coming in with no experience, was really important for me and valuable because that helped me shape the way I was going to do things moving forward personally. Interesting. So okay, let's talk about then you're moving into the girls, um, yeah. the girls to the girls' side. Tell us about that and, and what was your first impression, what the challenge is in working and changing over there? Do you know, it was a, it was it was a new challenge. It was something that I really wanted to do because I was obviously going through my badges that time. So I just finished my, um, my B license and I was going on to my A license. Um, and it was important that I was working eleven v eleven at that point before obviously it's all changed. And that opportunity come around, and I wanted to be able to still work with the boys, which I did, um, but still have an opportunity to go and work with a, an elite senior team and see what that looked like. Um, I was fortunate enough to get the opportunity to do it. I'm working at that level, so with I was working with senior players, whether that was club level or international. Um, was that going to be a big step up for me? Of course it was, because I hadn't worked with that sort of calibre of player, whether it's fail, uh, female or male. Um, was the challenges? Yeah, there was. There was. I had to find a way of convincing players that I was good enough to do it, because I was an unknown in that environment. Um, you've then got to convince yourself that you're good enough to do it, which I had to, and I thought I'd done that quite well within the first couple of years. Um, was the differences between the, between the male and female? Yeah, because I'd work with a YDP in a pre academy and was going into elite senior football, so there was going to be differences. Um, but working at seeing the differences now between senior football and youth football in terms of men or um, women, I think the the only difference I would always look at is the physical difference in the, the speed of the game at times, the speed of the game even with the youth age groups and the. 14, 16s within the boys' academy, their ball speed and their, the speed of their game is really high. Um, women's football is getting better, don't get me wrong. It's it's come on leaps and bounds and the game is getting better, 100%. But they were the challenges I found. I was work, We were working such a high intensity um, with the boys' sides. That might have not just been there at the time because the game was still growing and learning um, in the women's game. So that was probably the biggest challenge, adapting and getting people to buy into myself and the way I worked as a coach, but also getting used to the speed of the game and the differences in terms of, of the physical side of the game more than anything because I work with some top players at, at Everton in the women's game who were who were technically very, very, very good. Um but the speed of the game and the physical side was probably what what differed slightly. Tell us about session design and, and stuff like that in terms of you know what the sort of things you were delivering there. Uh, on the girl side, and you know, tell us about your your progression as a coach. You know, in terms of what you're what you you're putting out on the pitch. Yeah, so more around the session design. It was obviously Andy was the manager at the time, and we obviously had a real good relationship. And it was important that he knew my strengths, I knew his. Um, I I'm really hands on and like you to be on the pitch delivering, and um, more than sitting in an office doing anything. But I'm very thorough when I plan. Um, making sure that we got the right detail in, we were coaching the right concepts that we wanted around the philosophy of the club and the values of it. Um, so more around the practice and we designed a lot of, the way we tried to programme things, we do a lot of technical base work so at the start of a session, 
just trying to um, implement and refine and just more tune up in terms of technical proficiency with the ball. Um, but always linking that to the main theme, what we were looking at, but also the individual needs of those players. So looking at the individual players, even at that level, so all in terms of elite football in the women's game, they're still working towards ILOs, um, making sure that we can achieve them and we can we can make them better individuals and better players. Um, but the sessions, and we look to do a lot of technical work at the start of a session for a, a good block of 20 minutes. Um, and that might have been with passive pressure at times, um, or that could be completely unopposed, um, which I know there's obviously debates between if, if it's good to do it unopposed or not. Yeah. Um, but then we looked a lot into a, a more dual stuff then. So we do 15, 20 minutes of technical base work. We go into duels, which we do if it was 1v1, 2v2. And we, but we'd always look at, we always have a week where we don't overload or underload. So we'd always get that kind of, that bit of a, a grey gap that people don't always coach. Um, where we always go sometimes, we always match people up. Uh, and then the main theme would come in around um, whatever it was we were looking at towards a game week or what concepts we were looking to bring out for a certain game. Um, but also fo- mainly focusing on what the philosophy of the club was and how we had to get those concepts and beliefs out into the players. Um, so you, you mentioned uh, you mentioned ILO there. What's that independent learning? Yeah, uh, so the independent yeah. learning objectives, we always had them for players when we were there because when I was at Everton, so the, the group was still relatively young as a first team. Um, we had a lot of 16, 17, 18 year old players with a, a, probably a handful of uh, experienced players, if you want to call it. But they weren't experienced players in terms of age. They're experienced in players because they, they come into that first team environment so young. Um, right. But we also always had the ILOs for those players because I don't think anyone stops learning. And that was a good mindset that Andy had that he always wanted to make sure that these players could grow. If you were 28, 29, you were still growing as a player. Um, well, that's because that's, that's, that's quite interesting, isn't it? The, the like performance and the potential sort of, you know, the environments. So you're carrying that over from your work in the academy. So Mitchell, how would that work then, you know, with your first team players? How 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 often would you set the like the ILOs and, you know, how was that process involved? So we would look, we would usually set them around six to eight weeks, every six to eight weeks. And if that was that we'd set, someone saw three or four ILOs and they hadn't, they hadn't really probably hit where we wanted them to hit with one of them, we could leave it on. Um, because the player needs to still develop that area. But every six to eight weeks, me and Andy would sit down with the players. We'd block out time. And mainly, even being honest, all it was over international break. Um, we would have more time. Obviously, some players would be away. Um, and we'd catch up with them on, obviously, their return to the club. But it was more around how we could develop them as an individual, as a person, which was massive at everything. Um, how you can develop them as a person as well as a player. Um so looking at a lot of their technical areas, the tactical areas, obviously, because that was around performance at the elite level. Um, but also then, what 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 can we do in terms of to help them from an MDT in terms of physical, social, psychological part of the game, which is huge in terms of confidence, self-esteem. Um, so yeah, we've done that every six to eight weeks and tried to build that into our session plan and our design then in training. So as we know, a lot of sessions when you d- deliver at academy level or you're delivering at an elite level, your session is designed around your performance or your opposition or is it designed around your game model and how you're going to produce that. And what we try to do a lot of at Everton was put in place sessions that help the individual grow and met the individual needs and ILOs as much as we could. It wouldn't hit everyone's, don't get me wrong, but I think everyone within the sessions we tried to do because it was such a young group, we'd still try and get a lot of individual learning, um, which was important. But that comes to all, even being honest, a lot of that ILO stuff, we've done lots of unit work. Which I don't, I don't think you see a lot of, in terms of at elite level all the time. You don't, probably won't see a lot of unit work, um, but we've done a lot of that in terms of unit works, two units coming together or single units working together. That was more to get small details in, but it all always benefited the individual for me. Interesting, and and you, you mentioned the club philosophy. So tell us about the club philosophy, and was that linked to the to the men's team or the academy or what? what tell us about that. Yeah, yeah. So the the women's philosophy was it the it's a what it's a one club philosophy. So whatever whatever the club philosophy is, Everton Football Club, that's what the club philosophy is. They were the same values and beliefs, um, and we made sure that that was that underpinned in everything we done. Um, so from top to bottom, how we wanted to achieve things, what we wanted to do, um, had to be underpinned by that philosophy. Um, but the players, when we were there, lived and breathed that because they knew what Everton meant as a club and they knew what Everton meant as a team. Um, and yeah, it underpins no matter if it's men or women. It was a one-club philosophy and that was driven, obviously, by us as staff. Um, but yeah, it underpinned every single bit of work we'd done. Uh, so then tell us a bit about then you, you progressed to um, Liverpool. Tell us about that, how that came about. 
and then your role there? Yeah, so I left Everton. I'd been there for a long time. So when I was a when I was Everton, I'd been there a long time. And as you know, it's not. It's probably down to my own accountability, even being honest. Um, where I, I probably lost a little bit of fire in my stomach. Um, I think I need. I knew I needed the new challenge um, to get me going again. Um, and I made the decision then when I was around it to to obviously leave Everton within the summer, um, around June time it was, and um, an opportunity come up uh, at Liverpool. Um, I spoke to Neil Redfern, um, who wanted me to come on board, give me the opportunity to work with their under-21s girls academy side, um, which was a me probably a way of leading some for myself and having that exposure as a coach, um, but also going into something and trying to get that fire and love back for in my stomach because I lost it a little bit because I'd, I'd been doing the same thing and I was kind of in cruise control. Um, and then that opportunity come up and it was it was in, in unbelievable working with youth international players, um, 16, 17, 18, 19, um, whether that was England, Wales, a mixture of different um, nationalities. Um, and ju- the, what happened then, the women's game had just progressed at, at that level and they just started, obviously, a women's under-21s academy league. Um, but I come into the role so quite late. So I didn't come into the role till the start of September and they hadn't had the pre-season, these players. So I hadn't met any of the players. Um, obviously, because you have to go through all the required checks, DBS, etc. Um, so after all that was in place, I come into the role in the start of September. The players hadn't had the pre-season. I think they trained for probably a week before I come in. Um, so it was a learning curve for me because I was coming to an environment with not knowing any player, but having to start a season, um, making sure that we could be competitive in the league because I had high expectations and standards myself. And that I wanted to help these players grow and develop, but I wanted to help them achieve and understand what winning was, understanding what it was like to be successful, and um, to help them move on towards obviously first team football, which was my job to make them progress. So yeah, that was the next challenge at Liverpool, which was. What was the, what was the, what was, the, what was the main differences between Everton and Liverpool and that and the, the females set up? So the differences are at Everton. Everton had always had. A relatively strong youth setup and have been known for that all. Um, in terms of from a women's perspective, in terms of the players they've developed, Nikita Paris, Alex Greenwood. Um, you can go through a list of names, Michelle Hinnigan, these are all players who've played at a, a real, real good level. Um they had a real good strong infrastructure, Everton, from a from years back. So what you always knew you were going to produce players in Everton was a real was known for women's football. Liverpool were known for the women's side of the game, but didn't really have a strong setup until Matt Beard come in and obviously the Super League come live and that started to take off. They started to really make a name for themselves. But the only difference, as I'd say, was when I come into Liverpool, um, it was very welcome at the club, as was Everton. Um, so I haven't got many... I've got no bad thing to say about Everton or Liverpool in terms of the differences was I come in, I was able to lead something. I was given every bit of support. I was given that freedom to lead the group. Um, that I wanted was, was, to it, was, there, was there any difference in the playing philosophy, for example? Yeah, 100 percent Yeah, 100 percent In terms of the playing philosophy, that was that was the, that was what everyone wants everyone to do now is play off from the back and be confident and be brave to do so and retain the ball and have a possession based game, which we did. Um, it was more about dominating the ball, and then if we didn't have the ball, we had to get it back as quick as we could. Um, whereas Everton was more around, yeah, we want to be brave and play. We then want to high press if we can high press if we can't if we can't we'll sit in a real good organised shape and we'll win the ball back when we can if possible but we're not broken down easily whereas at Liverpool it was can we go and be aggressive on the front foot and win the ball back at all costs um, was that, was there, and, and tell us about that then in terms of then translating that to the pitch the training pitch and to the match was there any challenges in terms of that and you know introduce or like you know coaching that new philosophy that different yeah and I've always you try to there was it was going to be difficult because I'd always had a mindset for for years before that Everton where we had a really good clear organizational structure um if that's with or without the ball coming to Liverpool I always my own in terms of coaching philosophy and my personal philosophy anyway was about being a ball-based team being dominant with the ball so I already felt comfortable at delivering that so I didn't feel there was a challenge it was more around if he wanted to go and be aggressive on the front foot, I had to get the players. And you, as you know, you've got to have the personnel to go and perform in, t- in terms of elite environments. 
you've got to have the personnel to be able to drive that philosophy and the playing style um, with slight adjustments to make, obviously, it work for the team. But I wouldn't say there was many challenges in terms of, of me delivering it because I was confident enough to know what I need to do and when I need to do it and how I've done it. Um, it was more getting the players to buy in in a short space of time that I had to work with them because I'd only met them for the first session and then we were playing two days later. So it was trying to get them to buy into a possession-based game, which they already knew at that club, but then get them to buy into maybe slight differences in terms of the way I'd want things doing, um, whether that's on the pitch or off it, um, with or without the ball. I suppose that's the challenge as well. You know, if you're trying to... Liverpool's famous now for that high-pressing game and trying to encourage that. I suppose, like you said, you yeah. need the players to be able to do it physically and also, you know, if you haven't made a pre-season, what, how challenging was that? Oh, that was... Don't get me wrong, that was tough. Um Coming in, obviously, I, th- I think, even being honest, between September and Christmas, the Christmas time was probably the pre-season because um, we were training three days a week, which was three evenings, and then they play on a on a Saturday or a Sunday. So it become challenging um, because the first three months was virtually a pre-season for us, as well as still trying to develop the players individually and get them opportunities to be with the first team and make sure they're developing with their international careers at the same time because we had a lot of those players um, so that was tough in terms of making sure we got the principles right and the concepts right, but also making sure that we got them to a level a level of physical fitness where we need them to be to be able to perform, as you're saying, the the high pressing game to dominate the ball um, and how we done that. That was challenging, but do you know what? Credit to the players and having been on a soul, it was probably one of the best youth teams I've worked with um, since I've coached. They were absolutely incredible. I work with some top top um, international players, top club players who you probably think at times, why haven't you had a call-up at an international level, to be totally honest? But it, it all works differently. But they were the best group I work with, and kudos to them. They won the double in that season. Oh, did they? I was going to ask. Won the double them. in that season, and they didn't have a pre-season. And <clears throat> credit to them, do you know why? Because And, and so, so and how, does, how does that, at the 21s level, how does that work in terms of performance potential? Like you talked there, I mean, you know, how important is the winning, um, you know, how, while still developing? It's it as I said because because they come into so in in the women's game at the moment so they come into a women's environment now so it's classes in under twenty ones but they come from under sixteens to under twenty ones straight away wow so there's a big gap there but then yeah. you're trying to get a player from your under twenty ones team into your first team where the gap then is even bigger again so I was trying to work with I always work with the, the potential side of it and the talent side knowing that if I could get then those potential and talent. Um, pots to work together we'd, we'd have success somewhere and they'd feel success but I wanted to also instill into them so that if they went into a first team environment they've got to understand that, that that first team environment they've got to learn to win they've got to know what it feels like to win but they've also got to know what it feels like to 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 be defeated at times and not be successful and I think that season was key for us because we, we pushed the boundaries with them so much to challenge them individually which is the most important part and what was a what was really good to see still from the staff from the staff I had working with me, but credit to the players is out of the group I work with, seven of them went on to get professional contracts. Whether that was well, that, a, that, well, that was going to be my next question. How was it, how successful were you in getting players into the first team? Yeah, so, so from that, so that was that how 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 what was the time frame of those seven girls getting those so contracts? What, what happened is within that season we had numerous players trained up with the first team that have never trained with them before. <laughs> um, we then. Had at the end of the season, one of the girls signed a professional contract with the with Liverpool at the first team, and then there was six of the other players that moved on to other clubs within the league in terms of if it was the, the Super League One or the Women's Super League Two. Um, they'd signed professional contracts with teams within those leagues, so six of the players um, who then moved on after the season I left um, moved on. Then yeah, obviously to clubs within the same within the space of I'd probably say within the space of six months. Players with all those six, seven players had signed professional contracts with Liverpool or another club, which is obviously it's good. It's, it's interesting because one of my my clients I work with, she used to play for England. She was in the Chelsea twenty one setup, and she actually chose to go out to America do a scholarship. She's actually come back so now, plays for another different WSL team. But she was saying that actually because of the investment at Chelsea and the money they spent, the players they brought in, she was saying it was almost impossible, or even the management yeah. said it's very unlikely that we're going to even select anyone from the 21s because there's yeah. such a difficult gap. And obviously me knowing from my, my experience there, there's a big difference between the, the boys' academy at Chelsea and the girls' academy in terms yeah, of, you know, that, you know, 
so that's that would be my question is that how how you know, you've obviously done well you've bridged that gap quite well but i mean is that quite a common problem in the game in terms of especially now of all the you know the, the money that's come into it and maybe the big names coming from abroad a hundred percent so i can't 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 agree anymore to be totally honest because as i said here 16 to 21 is a big gap to come out of youth football and going into women's reserve team football if you want to call it they're then trying to bridge your gap and trying to get them from that from that reserve or well, the academy the academy squad into the first team but then how long do you keep your players for in that academy squad before they kind of stagnate so yeah the gap's going to get bigger and don't get me wrong with the women's super league how big it's gone it's i think in the last three four years it's absolutely took off you've got world-class athletes now in terms of if that's english players which we've got a lot of them um there's world-class athletes in terms of just come over you've got a chelsea arsenal manchester united man city all the teams throughout the league, you've got world-class players. It does become more difficult now for youth players to come through the system. But I always believe, for me personally, it's it depends who's in charge. So who's the manager at your club and how much do you live and breathe your youth section and youth football. And I know that now at Manchester United with Casey, um, who's a very good manager, a very good lead and a very good coach. In terms of she wants to produce young players, the club wants to produce young players on its own. Um, as well as going, yeah, and because you, you have to as a club, if you want to compete and you want to be successful, you've got to bring players in from abroad and from other countries. You have to, or you can't sustain it. Um, but we're very, very driven on giving young players opportunity, giving young players contracts, giving young players first team experiences. And being honest, the last two years with Casey, she's given numerous debuts to youth players who've come through the yeah. academy. She's given, you've got, we've got numerous players training with us week in, week out. Um, so, yeah, so I think let, the so, gap let's, is... let, so let's let's come back to that. I still want to, want to get to United, yeah, and I still want to get a bit of Liverpool out of you. Yeah, go <laughs> so on. Let's, so it's also you. So you you did the technical director of the girls' academy as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To that. So tell us a little bit about that, and then tell us a bit about the academy itself. This is part of the same, you know, discussion is it, in terms of like, yeah, development of the girls. Um, yeah. So after my first year with the obviously the academy under twenty ones, um, it was coming to the back end. It was around April time, and. Um, the technical director who was in place was leaving into moving to a, a new club to go into a new role, and I was asked would I step into those shoes around April time, and I did. We obviously had a month left, um, which was good. So I had a chance to obviously see what was going on, what work was going on already, um, and um, it enabled myself to really put a model in place that could be sustainable, but to help the team, the club, and the obviously the the players grow. And I come into that role then fully. Um, around May time, May, June, just towards pre-season for the, for the girls' academy squads. Um, but it was, you know what, it was a big task, I'll be honest. Um, but it's something I've learned a lot about technical programmes around what they should look like because we all brand the shit at what a programme should look like. But I think until you're actually put in a position where you've got to go and do it and the sole responsibility is with you, I think that tests your knowledge and character. Because so, so, what's, what, so, what, so what, what age is the first... Uh, age group, the age group at the girls academy starts at u10s so it goes from yes. under 10s to under 12s 14 16 but most clubs have under nines and under 11s to help bridge that gap because it comes it, quite, it comes quite big and um, with right. the young ones so we were doing a, uh, a under nine to under 16s program Um i then had probably a month six weeks max to Assess what was going on in that April month and May month. Then I had June to put up together a trial process because it runs totally different to the way the, the boys does. So, so you have a trial process every season. So you can sign players back on who you want to sign on. You can tell play other players after that season they can retrial because you want to see you haven't seen enough from them. But then you have trials in the summer in June time over a week period where it's obviously open to anyone in terms of grassroots football, county football, so on and so forth. So we had to put a trial process together. I had to then have to put together a technical syllabus for the each age group going through, but making sure that this model, so which it was massive on, was it was linked to Liverpool Football Club. It had their values and beliefs. It had their methodology and the way they wanted to work. But it also everything was underpinned within this model of how we wanted to play as a football club. But I had to dilute that for each age group. So give us, a, give us a bit of a taste then. This is, you know, this is the juicy bits everyone wants to hear. Give us a bit of the, uh, like the nines and tens. You know, what's their sort of technical? So a lot, a lot on the, on the nines and tens, we I encourage a lot with them. So and you're obviously huge and you're telling me the detail around it, but we've done a lot of ball familiarisation. Uh, everything was around duels. 
So it was 1v1s, it was 2v1s. We don't underload and overload because I'm massive on that because that's what the game is. Um, yeah. So we've done a lot on that. And then they do they do parts of, well, they don't have a big part of their program was around ball striking. Um, so could they strike the ball cleanly with different services off both feet? Um, which was, that was the, really the main key themes were duels. It was around ball familiarization and ball striking. But then we introduced the topics around within ball striking, you might introduce a little bit of the passing stuff and those things. But I thought at those younger age groups, the ball striking, ball familiarization and duels was really important that we got that right because I believed and the club believed that we wanted players to be dominant when we get 1v1. We want a place to be really hard to beat when they're 1v1. We want players to be able to press and be aggressive. We want players to be able to pass a ball, strike a ball and be confident at doing so off both feet. Um, and we obviously players to stay on the ball to so and be creative and be skillful. And we encourage that a lot. And they were the three main blocks of, of work we looked at. But within those blocks of work, so as you know, we underpinned that with different kind of focuses and different elements, um, which were important to those U9s and U10s age groups. Um, we still had small blocks that probably half of those probably a third of that was still involved at U11s but then we started to look at more how we could get players to understand in terms of in terms of positional stuff when um, as a if you're playing 9v9 for example we all, I always encouraged if it was someone who liked playing as a right fullback I'd always encourage them to play as a right forward too because I want them to have that familiarisation that I can play here or here so we get a player who's not just one dimension. We don't pigeonhole them too early. Um, so I always done it with, we we had a set system the way we played and a set structure the way we played. So you had two systems they'd play because those two systems were played by the first team. So what we done is when you diluted it down to 7v7 or 9v9, we enabled the player if they were a central defender that they could play as a number six because I want them to have that different, that other option if they need to play there or if, we need, if they need it as a team that they're not one dimensional and they can only play in one position. So we started to introduce a little bit of position stuff in terms of at the early stages of the under 11s. We introduced that more at under 12s, but there was always still an element of uh, every age group and that's going to 16s. There was always an element of duels, underload, underload, um, underload or um, overload all the time. And there was always a, a part of it around ball familiarization and ball striking at the same time because it's the physical differences, not with everyone, by the way, but the physical difference at the younger age groups is a lot of the younger players in women's football didn't always have the physical capabilities. So I wanted to make sure that we were we were enabling ourselves at the same time to, we're not going to stick them in a gym, so let's be honest, but we put them in situations where they had to use the body. They had to strike a ball to, to gain leg strength um, and different ways we could incorporate the, the physical performance side but with a ball all the time. Um, so yeah, all the way up to 16s, they've done duels all the time, but up from U9 to U10 to U11 to U12, there was ball striking in all the time. Um, and, 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 and tell us about then, what were, the, what were some of the major challenges being the, the director, the academy director, like in terms of, for example, coaching, you know, upskilling coaches, motivating the coaches, getting the coaches to buy in, those sorts of things. What are the main yeah, things that are? The key, the key part of that, and I enjoyed that side of it, having to be, I kind of, I'm a manager in a way. I had to manage staff. I had to manage players. The biggest one, as we all know, you have to manage parents. But I think if you can, you can manage parents correctly and you can, you come across in the right way. Parents will always respect what you do and respect what you say. Um, and that's something I learned very quickly was um, if I ever had a problem with a parent, I'd always be up front. We'd be up front with the player, up front with the parents, and then we'd, we'd have a clean slate and we'd work. If that was staff, some of the, the parts I really enjoyed was upskilling staff and, I'm not someone who knows anything, so I know 1% of football and I'm always learning. But I made sure that everything I knew and I'd learned over the years, whether that was from coaches I work with at Everton, courses, etc., cetera, uh, from networking, um, I always tried to upskill the coaches. So we had a real strong CPD programme in place for the staff um, where we go and watch. Sometimes we'd, we'd go and watch the under-23s um, boys and we'd set tasks in terms of for the staff to do, so to, to learn. Um we recorded a lot of the training sessions and we give the staff feedback in terms of on the coaching delivery and what we could improve on. And was it aligned to what we were, were coaching for the, what the club want for the philosophy. Um, so looking at loads of different ways we could do it. We've done a lot of team bonding, staff bonding, which was key and um, trying to get a real good togetherness between us. But I had a really good group of staff there um, who bought into what we wanted to do, 
But the most important part, I just worked hard. Worked hard, gave me everything I had, and I didn't have any issues with that. The only ones you then have, the issues is you always get coming the back end of a season, so is when you've got to retain and release. Like, when you've got to retain and release players, it's never easy. And it always seems to be the technical director who gets the release ones. So, yeah, they would probably do any different conversations. But if you do things right, I believe, and you're honest with the player throughout the season, you're giving them the best opportunity to, to, to succeed, but you're giving them the best opportunity then at the same time to go, it might not be for you at this time. We need to look, you need to look at something else maybe. And I think if you're open and honest with your ILOs when you do them, you put your player reviews and reflections with parents when we've done three times a year. I think if you're open and honest within them, so and you highlight the areas that they're maybe not hitting the, the thing we need them to hit, um, I think those conversations become easier. So really with parents, I didn't really have an issue, which was probably a surprise. Um, it was more around getting all the work and getting all the work in with the youth age groups because I was still leading in the 21s. So my days become really long. Um, but you know what? I absolutely loved it because I learned a lot about myself as a coach. I learned a lot about how I had to lead and manage staff, um, which was really important. And so tell us about then, so now the, you, tell us about the May United move and how that came about. So the Manchester United move come about, um, that come around January time. Um, I'd obviously had, with Liverpool, I'd, we just, we'd obviously had a, how do you want to say, you, we had a, we didn't agree on terms, in other words. Um, I, obviously, I had my thoughts on what I wanted and they had their thoughts on what they wanted and obviously, we then didn't agree a contract. So, I was then, made the decision, obviously, I'd come away from it. Um, and then, obviously, I, I took probably two or three months all to kind of, the next one was going to be big for me because I needed to make the right decision. Um, I was getting on a little bit and I need to make sure that I'm making sure that I can make the right decision, not just from a football perspective, which is the number one thing in my head all the time when I make a decision. Is it right for me football and wise? But it was also right for me personally because I didn't want to keep, I don't want to be in a job for two or three, two or three years and then leave it, two or three years and then leave it because it puts you in a situation where you just constantly globe hop, um, hopping all the time. So, yeah, that come around in January. Um, a person I'm really close with who obviously works at Man United um, with their under-21s, the academy manager, Charlotte. Um, she approached me and asked me, would obviously I'd be interested in um, coming into a role at Manchester United with the under-21s because her assistant had left. And surprisingly, her assistant had gone to Liverpool to take the role I had. Um, there you go. <laughs> so she asked me and I said, yeah, I'd just get my feet back on the ground. I was coaching four days a week with the game on a weekend in the evenings. But what was good for me, so all I wanted to really just get back on the grass and deliver because with my previous role, I was on the grass delivering as much as I could, probably 80% of the time, but you still had the other backlog to deal with. Whereas in this role, it was just, I just want to come in and coach if I can, tell me what I need to do and I'll do it. And you know what? I absolutely, I absolutely loved it. Coming in January, the club was so welcoming in terms of what they um, they done for me. I was introduced to everyone I need to be introduced to. Um, the processes were really quick. Um, and then I was on the pitch coaching within three, four weeks. So I had absolutely no issues. And um, when everything was cleared through DBS and everything, I was in and around, obviously, the under-21s girls, um, able to get on the pitch and coach again. And then I think that materialised then. I was um, really welcomed by Casey, obviously the first team manager, when she was there, obviously with her being there. Um, I'd been and asked her to watch some of the first team sessions so I could see how they were working. And um, So then I could link that back to the under-21s. Um, watched a lot of theirs and she then asked me to come down and be around her a couple of times um, and obviously on, on on a game day a couple of times asked me to, to give her any feedback that I'd seen during the game if that was half time or that was the, a couple of days after um, in terms of how they played um, and it materialised from there we obviously went into a lockdown in March um, which I thought had completely killed my chances of progressing at the club because it was like it hit all clubs hard but it didn't, you know what? And then it comes to July and um, the, Casey's assistant was obviously retiring. Um, so Casey asked me then in July, would I be interested in coming in as their assistant um, with the first team? And was I shocked yet? Because I'd only been at the club on a short space of time. I'd obviously had known, I'd known Casey, well, played against Casey as a player. So she had when I coached when I was Everton and so on and so forth. But she gave me the opportunity then in July to come and work alongside her. And I think 
I'm hoping that it's the way I have done with the under-21s up to that point. Um, and it was anything I've said or done that she took a liking to what I, how I was as a person and as a coach. Um, and yeah, since then, it's been unbelievable. It's probably, I'm probably enjoying my football now, so more than I enjoyed it or as close as I was enjoying it at the start of when I was in Everton with the, the boys set up. Um, when I just, you just get in, you've got to find your stomach, you want to coach all the time. Um, yeah, and I'm in a real good space. Um, so, so yeah. tell us about the, what, what, so what's, I mean, look, May United, Liverpool's a massive club, Everton's a massive club, but, you know, United, which is, you know, juggle of a brand, you know, historically. What, what are the main differences in terms of, you know, the main differences getting into, into that club or, you know, just generally, you know, the, You've got, I wouldn't say there was, I'd say the infrastructure, the, in terms of the women's setup, the infrastructure and the way they want to do things as, as a club, as a brand, is, is is they want to do everything to perfection, which I, I really like. They want everything to be done professionally. Um, there's, there's no messing about. If we're going to do it, we're going to do it and we're going to run with it, um, which is really good. But everything's done with a strategic plan behind it. So strategically, everything's got to sit right. From a business point of view, it's got to sit right, which is good. Um, but when they do it, whether that's staffing, it's done properly. Um, you don't see a diff- differentiation between whatever the... If you work for Manchester United as a member of staff, it's that's you're a Manchester United member of staff. It's not the women's team or the men's team. You work for Manchester United and you're part of that club, um, which is a really good, really good um, club to be a part of because... You know that everyone's working for one another. There's no separation between men and women. Um, so that's really that was probably a key part in terms of the different the difference between tell us, some parts. Tell, tell us about tell us about the uh, then the playing philosophy. What's uh, what how's that? What's how's that work? The so the playing philosophy is as a club in terms of the way as you know at the elite level a manager who's in charge of that team so will put forward obviously his philosophy, his ideas, his game model and. Casey's done the exact same. She puts across her game model, her philosophy, and the way she wants to play. Um, Man United, as you know, they want to play an attacking brand of football. They want to be exciting to watch. Um, they want to make sure that they're winning, obviously winning titles, are successful, they're doing the right things. Um, they make sure, obviously, they're keeping fans happy and things like that, which is important. So that playing philosophy is, is very driven by the manager, but it's underpinned by the values of the club. Um, but you'll see... If you watch a Man United men's team and you watch a Man United women's team, you're going to see the same brand of football because that's what the club wants as a model. Um, so, yeah, as much as the manager's influence on the coaching philosophy and the playing philosophy is to be exciting and be um, a really attacking, fast and footballing team, you're going to see the same right across the club. And that, for me, is perfect because that's what I believe in too. I want to play exciting football. I want to play attacking football. I want to dominate the ball. Um and that's been that's so been. So then, so, so then, tell us about that. Your what? Well, tell us about your average week. Then you know, go through your week from Monday. How does that work? Yeah. So, so my, if I'm going through my week from if we're playing on a Sunday, if we play Sunday, we we're off Monday. So if you go Sunday to Sunday, we're off Monday after the game. Um, we train Tuesday, um, which is usually around midday, so we give the players more rest time. Um, so we train Tuesday, we train Wednesday, we're off Thursday, we're in Friday. Um, in Saturday, match day minus one, then obviously play Sunday. So we have a two-day lead into our games. That depends, though, and that differs so all depending on if we play a midweek game, this, the schedule will differ. But, um, yeah, that's what really our, our week would look like Sunday to Sunday, Monday and off. Tell us about then, and tell us about then in terms of your planning and preparation. How does that work? So, you know, how much is it is reaction from the, from the weekend game? How much is, you know, long-term planning? And what's yes. your role in that? So uh, within within the week, if we've just finished the game, obviously we do a lot of post game reflection, which Casey does. Is, it's really impressive. I learned a lot from her on it um, in terms of delivering the post game reflection in a way that keeps your players motivated and still enthused. But also, we're still looking at developing these individuals. These aren't finished articles, whether the first team footballs or not. Um, so Casey delivers all, most of the um, match analysis. We'll split a little bit of work in terms of with the ball and without the ball in terms of how we deliver that with each other. Um, so I might deliver a bit of in-possession, she'll deliver the out-of-possession. Um, and then throughout the week, in terms of um, leading up to games, a lot of the focus is on us, how we want to play and how we're going to exploit the opposition, which is brilliant because you always get, I think a lot of teams might focus on what are the opposition going to do and how are we going to exploit it. When Casey's mindset, which is really good and I love it, is 
how are we going to exploit the opposition with what we can do? What are our strengths and how are we going to play them to exploit the opposition? Yet you do have a small focus of the opponents in mind because you watch the games, you do the your analysis on them. But we always focus on us and that's really, we have, it depends what we're trying to focus, what we're putting a bigger emphasis on. So we might have two days in possession, two days out of possession in the match day minus one. Or we might have two days out of possession, one day in, and then a match day minus one. It depends what the bigger emphasis is going to be on, what we think is going to win us the game. Um, but yeah, that's really the way the week lies. It's it's a mixture of me and Casey coaching throughout the week. Um, match day minus one is Casey. She'll obviously do all her tactical work. Um, but we work really well together, I believe, in terms of she was one of the best defenders that's ever played the English game in women's football. She's got over 100, 100 caps for England. She's got over... She's got an unbelievable amount of senior caps domestically. So her knowledge def- as a def- from a defensive point of view is incredible. From an offensive point of view, she's really good. Um, but we we work really well to our own strengths, which I think is important. Um, but we work really well together. I respect her really highly for what she's done in the women's game, and I'm learning so much from it. Um, and and so, so, so talking, reflecting on your time at Everton, that first um, women's Super League team, yeah, yeah. About developing individuals and you know, your individual development plans. How does that transfer now and at May United now? Some, you know, it's a much more bigger performance stage. You still get the time there to try and, you know, potential and deliver, work with those and develop those individuals. How, do you, how, does, how does that sit into your performance week? Yeah, so if I'm, if I'm being honest, it's probably bigger at United. Right. Casey's really big on individual development, making sure that players are given the opportunity to develop within their units, but as individuals on their own. Um after every single training session we have, they have 15, 20 minutes to do their own individual work um, where players will come together and do group work. If it's two wingers, might come together. Casey, for example, the other day took the back line and done some work in terms of on their travelling and their movements in terms of defensively. If it's got the balls going wide, did the balls going central. Um, so they get so much individual work and it's probably higher emphasis now because of how um, high Casey's standards are of wanting individuals to be better. Um, and helping them grow, which he's really big on. Um, so it's probably more, but they're more fitted in. So after the training sessions we have this, in, during the week, um, right. but there's not there's there's a lot of times throughout the week so where we're talking about technical work and technical development and proficiency that we do 15, 20 minutes every session of technical based work, whether that's unit work or whether that's individual work or small collective work. Um, we'll do lots of technical proficiency work. So the, a lot of the players are going to get their IDP and hit their targets they want to hit within those sessions. But every player gets one. Every player sits down with Casey every six to eight weeks. They get a very thorough plan in terms of what they want to develop themselves, but also what we want to help them develop as a as a club. We believe they need to develop. Um, but then obviously the input into that one is their international one if they're a, an international player. So yeah, mainly after the sessions, they get a lot. They get 15, 20 minutes of work they can do themselves. But throughout the sessions with the themes and the way we do things, it's really, it's really thorough. Yeah. And I mean, it's interesting to, to think about that. So, so tell us about the coaching team. So you got, obviously Casey's leading it. Yeah. You're yeah. Assistant coach. Who else, how else, is there any else in the coaching team? Yeah. So there's, there's myself, there's Casey. Um, there is, yes, yeah, so myself, Casey, you've got the goalkeeping coach, Ian Wilcock. You've got El Turner, who I think believes one of the best sports scientists about. Um, you've got, the the physio in terms of who's there we've got nutritionist support we've got well-being support i think the well-being support one's massive for players at that elite level um with what they probably have to deal with um it's really important that they're given the right well-being support and they get the opportunity to really air any frustrations they've got maybe sort of get the support they need and um, then you, if you look away from that you've got your media team you've got your comms team the group the staff and group the MET group's huge um but the good thing is every single one of us are pulling in the right direction and we're all pulling together on the same boat, um, which is really important. But we've got a massive... And, and, staff. and then talk about then, because obviously you, your experience with the 21s, you were then, you talked about Casey really keen to to promote within and develop. How does it work then in terms of the 21s and the, the first team? How, how much interaction do they get? How often do you pull players up and how does that work? So players come up regularly. So to be totally honest, players come up quite regular. Um at the moment, we've got two or three training with us now from the under twenty ones who are seventeen years of age. Um, last season, Casey had numerous players up from the under twenty ones. Sometimes, even being honest, over the international break, she has the whole squad up, so both teams will train alongside each other. Um, 
he's had them up to play eleven v eleven. So throughout the season, I I believe there's there's more than a dozen players that well probably I'd probably say half a dozen, six or seven players usually get the opportunity to come up and train at least, and um, so she can give them that opportunity to see what the first team environment's like. But it has to be earned. So she's seeing what the twenty ones manager says how they're playing and performing in games. And then what she tries to do from that, that um, part is give them the opportunity then to really see what a first team environment's like and see if it's for them. Interesting. Okay, tell us a little bit about then the pressure. You're like, you're working at the highest level of the yeah. women's game now, massive club. You talked about the club's expectations, yeah. what, they, what they're like. I mean, what is that like for you as a coach and, you know, and how important are like, uh, those three points on the weekend? <laughs> yeah, don't get me wrong, they're important because you've got, you're trying to, you've set yourself as a team and as a staffing group and as a collective, as a club, we set ourselves targets. So we want to achieve them. And that's important that to make sure that we can, we can achieve them week in, week out. The three points on the weekend, everyone wants to get, don't get me wrong. We battle, we battle so hard to get them. Um, however, we've then got to also take into consideration that the club's been, the women's team's been running two, three seasons. This will be its third season. So we know that we've still got a lot of growing, so we've got a lot of maturing to do. Um, and it's going to take time for things to to really take off and achieve what we want to achieve. However, everyone's aim every single week is to get three points. Is the pressure? Yeah. Do you feel pressure? Yeah, you probably do because I don't want to lose. I don't like losing. I'm probably the worst loser if I'm honest. Um, but one thing I try to tell myself, Med, is pressure is a privilege. So if there's pressure on you, it's, it's, it's good at the same time because you're deserving to have that pressure. So it's it's more not... I don't feel the pressure in terms of we've got to get pressure to win three points. I look at pre- pressure more around performance. My pressure, the pressure I see is, can we get the players to perform? There's pressure to get them to perform. And if we can get them to perform, the result in the three points looks after itself. Um, I don't really focus on the three points. It's more focusing on performance and how we can get them to, to perform, but now sustain it. Um, and at the moment, we're in a real good space. Um, we're doing all right. We're making sure the players are sustaining performance week in, week out. We're trying to push players that have got potential to help them try and maximise that potential, um, which is good. But yeah, I don't really see pressure as, as a way of I've got to get three points. I just see it as more from a performance point of view. Has what I've done on the pitch this week and me and Casey done on the pitch. If I've done something as an individual and I've coached something, is that starting to see be seen on the pitch? That's the pressure I put myself under. But I, and if if they're doing it well, they're doing it well. If they're not, I've got to take that pressure to go. Well, I need to do this more, or I need to develop this area. But I don't put the pressure on myself really, or I don't think we do as a group, as a, as a team. And Katie doesn't at all. She doesn't put the pressure on to say it's got to be three points because, and she's very clear at saying in terms of um, every single week that what this game doesn't define your season, and I don't think it does. Every game doesn't define your season. Um, but if we can make sure we maintain a consistent performance level that we can get where we want to be and achieve what we want to achieve. Interesting. And then what about yourself? I mean, you've, you've, you've been assistant now at two different WSL teams. Yeah. Do, do, would you, what's your ambitions for the future? Do, do, would you like to be the head coach of a, of a team? Or you- Hopefully so. Yeah, down the line. I'm trying. I, you know, I really enjoy, this might sound silly to some people, but I really enjoy being an assistant at the moment. Um, and I enjoy, I've enjoyed being an assistant when I was at Everton because I'm able to take a step back see the game from a totally different perspective and um, enables me to reflect more before I make decisions. Um, but yeah, I'm hoping down the line, I'm going to be given an opportunity to manage, um, manage a, a club, manage a team and be able to put into place my own philosophy, coaching philosophy and methodology in the way I want to work um, and hopefully be successful. So somewhere down the line, whether that's domestically or international football, um, <clears throat> I'd like to think that, I'll be given an opportunity to put in put in practice my own model, um, but I think that's I'm not looking at that any any time any time coming up. I'm looking at it probably more down the line, five, six, seven, eight, nine years. Do you think do you think you'd stay in the women's game, or you'd you'd come back into you go into the men's game, or do you think there's maybe? Not, do you think once you're in the women's game, you're in the women's game, sort of thing? No, no, I don't. You know what? I don't. I don't think that at all. I think the right opportunity, whether it's female or male will make a difference to me. Um, it's just got to be the right opportunity and the right fit um, <clears throat> from a, a football point of view, from, but from a business perspective in terms of what ambitions the club have got and things like that. So, yeah, male or female, I haven't got a preference. Um, as long as it's 
it fits with myself and what and I have the same ambitions as what the club does. Um I'd work in either game. It wouldn't would make a difference. I come back into the I go to the into men's football now or boys' football now if the opportunity was right. Um <clears throat> but at this moment in time, I've probably never been happier in football in terms of what I'm doing. Um so uh, hopefully I'm not going to touch wood, I'm not going to be moving anytime soon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and just um, you've had quite a remarkable career already in terms of you work some massive clubs and you work in the boys' game and the female game. What would your advice be to a young aspiring coach who wants to, you know, work at the highest level like you are? I, the biggest one is probably the way they probably use a lot, just be courageous, um, take risk, which is a big one. But all a big one is probably for me is education. Educate yourself on what you want to do and um, where you want to get to. Educate yourself on where the game is and where it needs to go and where you want to take it. But then be courageous and brave to make your own decisions. Because <clears throat> a lot of coaches nowadays, you'll see that you'll see the elite managers working and you'll see a Pep Guardiola, uh, Diego Simeone, whoever the all the big managers in world football. And a young coach will always look at one of them and try and put in practice what they're doing. How do they do that? And I'm going to try and do it. But I'd always say be courageous and brave, but be unique with your own ideas. So always have a, a, a selling point for yourself where if I'm going to be a coach, my unique selling point is this and my way of getting a job is this. Um, and that's probably the biggest part. Be courageous and brave, but be unique in terms of what you are as a coach. Be yourself. Um, don't and, try and be and, someone else. And what about, you know, you, you mentioned it earlier about your, you getting that break. What about that, you know, trying to get into the game, getting that first step on the ladder? <laughs> Networking's a big one. Um, networking, speaking to people, whether that's on social media, um, all those platforms, <clears throat> a lot of events. So, so you've got a lot of you have a lot of conferences that go on. Whereas the FA conference is the one that happens in Wales. Um, there's lots of different conferences that go on, a lot of courses that go on. Um, getting on them and networking is key. Um, but another big one for me is volunteering. I don't know. I done so many volunteer hours when I was younger um, <clears throat> to make sure that I demonstrated that I was committed and I was hard working, and I really wanted the opportunity. And that for me was key to get that break in. I think you've got to really, you've obviously now, as the game moves forward and it modernises, obviously you need the right qualifications and badges to get in at, at certain levels. Um, <clears throat> but I'd always say do lots of volunteering and show that you're committed to what you want to do. Fantastic. Mine, Ho. Thank you very much, mate. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you. Appreciate it.